Hello, I'm uh, Jeff Freiner. I'm the Director of Enterprise Information Security here at Mozilla. I'm super excited to welcome Miko Hoping in here to the Mozilla uh, Mountain View office. Uh, Miko's been involved in computer security, I think, as long as computer security has been an industry. <laughs> and I say that not to call him old, uh, but to recognize his experience. I think he's been involved in everything from the very first uh, uh, computer virus to some of the most sophisticated computer viruses the world has ever seen. I'm super excited to hear what he's got to say about computer security, the past, the present, and the future. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Miko. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us here live in, in California, and thus of, thanks to all of you who are watching us online. Indeed, my name is Mikko, and yes, I've been, been around forever. Fun fact, um, I was two years ago lecturing at Stanford, not too far away from here, and if you go to the William Gates building in, in, in Stanford, in the lobby, there's this thing on the wall to commemorate the creation of the TCP IP protocol, which is, of course, which, which runs the internet, as we know, and, uh, and it mentions Windsurf and a couple of the other Stanford guys who were involved in it, and it, it dates the creation of the protocol to December 1969. And I was born in October 1969, so I'm older than the internet. <laughs> 69 must have been a good year. You know, we went to the moon, we had Woodstock, created the internet. I was born, I like that. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's, it's really good to be here, here in uh, Mozilla. I'm a big fan of your work, and uh, it's, it's nice to be able to talk to you guys today. It's also nice to be um, in Silicon Valley. What I plan to do in the afternoon is go and visit um, <clears throat> one of my favorite companies, which is Atari or I'm going to go and look at the old offices where they used to be when, during the golden years when they made uh, the classic video games in the 1970s and 80s. And my, I guess my favorite video game from Atari is from 1983, a coin-operated laserdisc-based video game where you uh, fly a plane called Firefox. Some of you might have heard about this, remember this video game. If you haven't, Google it. There's a video game from Atari called Firefox, which I think is nicely relevant to what we're speaking about today. So, some of you might actually know that years ago, um, when I was going through our old archive of malware, you know, the ones we used to collect in the early 1990s, late 1980s, uh, I found a copy of the very first PC virus, this floppy right here. And of course, I would have that floppy with me here, except I don't have that anymore. And the reason why I don't have that floppy anymore is that while we were investigating this virus, which is called Brain.A, uh, we found that hidden within the boot sector of every infected floppy disk, hidden in the middle of the code, is a piece of text, which says, 1986, Basit and Amjad, and it lists an address, Nizam Block, Alama Iqbal Town, Lahore, which is a city in Pakistan. So five years ago, I took my brain.a floppy and I flew to Pakistan, I traveled to Lahore, I went to Alama Iqbal town and I knocked on the door on the address listed in the first PC virus in history. And inside I found Basit and Amjad standing up. Is Basit sitting down next to him, is his brother Amjad. These are the guys who wrote the very first PC virus and I left my brain.a with them. I sort of brought it back home, if you will. But we had a very interesting discussion about the birth of this problem, birth of malware, birth of PC viruses. Um, these guys were, of course, much younger in 1986 when they wrote the first PC virus, and they were basically just trying to prove how insecure these new PCs were com compared to mainframes and other stuff these guys had been working with before IBM PCs started going around the world, and I guess they did prove a point. Their virus went around the world, infected systems in more, 50, in more than 50 different countries, and, uh, and also started this whole problem. And these guys complained to me how they are so fed up because they are nowadays getting infected by all kinds of malware regularly on their computers, and of course it's their own fault because they started the whole problem. But as 
this problem got started back then in 1986, we've gone through many different revolutions of malware. Uh, one interesting detail or, or outlier in history of malware is a virus called AIDS Information Trojan, which is from 1989, three years after Brain. And this is interesting because this is the first ransomware Trojan in history. Ransomware like WannaCry or Petya, the two biggest cases from, from last year. Ransomware in the sense that it locks your data. It locks you out of your own data and asks you to pay to get your files back. In this case, it wasn't distributed over the internet because, because, but it was actually mailed in letters to subscribers of a, uh, I think it was PC World or PC Magazine. So they actually got this in the mail and it claimed to be a useful application which would rank your risk of getting infected by this new, new uh, disease called HIV. And it actually would work. It would install it on your PC and it would like ask you questions and rank your risk. But it would also after five or six or seven days, start encrypting your hard drive. And then it would show you a ransom note. When you would boot up the machine, the machine wouldn't start. Instead, it would show you a ransom note which would ask you to pay money by sending it to, as a money order to a PO box in Panama. And this actually is surprisingly similar to the Petya ransom trojan, or actually many current ransom trojans that we see today. And there really is this decades of time between these two cases. But ransomware isn't actually a new problem. This is a complete outlier. I mean, 1989, AIDS information trojan was pretty much the only ransom trojan we saw until a couple of years ago. But you know, these ideas keep coming back and, and bite us. If you think back then how things evolved from these old floppy-based viruses, um, well, these were all infecting boot sectors, so you would get infected by forgetting a floppy, a five and quarter inch floppy or three or and a half inch floppy inside your computer and then booting the computer up. If it's a PC, it starts executing code from the boot sector of the floppy and that's how you get infected. Once it's on your hard drive, then it will infect every floppy you use. In Macs at the time, which were still uh, before OS X running system as operating system, uh, you would actually be infected by just inserting a floppy. Mac would automatically execute a piece of code from the floppy just by inserting it. You didn't actually have to reboot from it like you did with, with PCs. But fairly quickly, we started seeing file infectors, which would be spreading over networks. And eventually, they would start spreading over the internet as internet became commonplace. And then we started to enter the time of email worms. And you probably remember large outbreaks like Melissa or... Love Letter, also known as I Love You. These were the biggest cases in email worm outbreaks. And these were, these were from 1999 and 2000. And the spreading mechanism in these was very simple. They would infect a single user. They would gain access to his email application, typically Outlook, Windows uh, or Microsoft Outlook. And then they would send themselves as or in the name of the owner of the computer to everyone listed in the address book. So you can easily see how this works. If you know someone, you suddenly get an email from him, from his email address, with his name, sending something to you. And you know him because you're in his address book. So it's highly likely you trust him. Or at least many of, many, in many communications, that's going to happen. And if there's an attachment, you're going to open it. And the attachments Love Letter and Melissa used were Word documents. They were using Word macros, later known as Visual Basic for Applications, which is the programming feature inside Office applications. And if you actually look at uh, early macro-based viruses, they are just macros inside Word documents. And this is very similar to what we're seeing still today. We are seeing macro-born malware even today with today's users in 2018, which is quite remarkable. Microsoft thought they already fixed this problem once when these early macroviruses like Melissa and Love Letter were going around. They did it by disabling macros by default in Office applications. However, macros are still there. They're just disabled by default. So what we're seeing nowadays is macro-born attacks where users get uh, Word or Excel documents which will then talk them through enabling macros. So they will, for, for example, tell that this is a classified document, very important classified document, and you are very important because you received this, and now you have to decrypt it by enabling content. So please click the Enable Content button. People are social engineered into enabling macros back, 
and we go back to the same problem we had in 1999. So these were email worms. But then we next get into the world of web worms or internet worms, things which would spread over the internet without using email. And I guess the best known first example of this would be Code Red from 2001. I actually have a uh, visualization on how Code Red went around the world on July 19th, 2001. Um, well, that's, that's the, pretty much the current internet um, or where, where, where servers existed at the time. Um, and you can see the growth rate get exponential as enough computers get infected. And this basically happens over, over 24 hours. Code Red was bad, but what followed next was even worse. We had a row of similar internet-born worms like Slapper, Slammer and Blaster. And of these, Slammer broke the world record. It actually went through every single IPv4 address on the planet in 17 minutes from the moment when it was launched. So if you were online in 2003, around July 2003, when Slammer was unleashed, if you were online, Slammer scanned your IP address. It scanned the IP address of every server you had, every workstation you had. If you had a, well, you didn't have a phone which would be online on the internet in 2003, but you know, it would scan through every single device you had. And if you had a vulnerability it could exploit, it would infect your system. And this was all done in 17 minutes. In 17 minutes, it had already done everything. It had already infected every system it could infect in the world, which is quite remarkable. Now, Slammer, Sasser, and Blaster were all Windows-based uh, malware cases. And the way they would typically manifest themselves to the victims, to the users who were running these computers, is that they would get some kind of an error message from Windows itself. Because these were typically uh, exploiting um, RPC processes or LS ASS processes, which are Windows system processes. And when you exploited them at the time, those processes would die. And these are critical Windows processes, which means Windows will warn the user that the critical Windows process has died. And now Windows, this is Windows XP, now Windows will reboot. You have 60 seconds to save your work, then Windows will reboot. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to, to prevent this. There's no cancel button. You have 60 seconds to save your stuff, then it's going to reboot. Now imagine that you're being hit by Blaster in 2003. You get this, your machine reboots, all right? You continue working, eventually it's going to happen again. You're still online, you still have the vulnerability. After an hour, you see it again. After half an hour, again. And you're going to see it more and more frequently as there are more and more infected machines on the planet scanning more and more. So eventually you're going to go and ask for help. But my machine is acting funny, it's rebooting all the time, what should I do? And someone's going to tell you that, yeah, it's a, there's a vulnerability, you have to patch it. Now, this is 2003. There is no internet, uh, there's no Windows update. So the way you update is that you take your browser, i.e. here. <laughs> I guess you could take Netscape in 2003. And uh, you would go manually, surf to uh, Microsoft.com, search for the update. You find the update, and then you have the button to click. Let's download it. Let's save it to the desktop as you would, and we start downloading it. This is how people were updating their systems at the time. But while you're downloading it, you're still vulnerable. So it's more than likely that while you're downloading, it's going to take a while to download, you will get the same error message as you saw earlier. So, and now you have two counters on your screen. <laughs> One is counting down 60 seconds before you reboot. One is counting up how, how finished your download is. A very, very frustrating game which was being played by thousands and thousands of users all over the world. And of course, in many cases, they lost this. And this really was the turning point for Microsoft. Microsoft customers didn't find this funny. Um, they started demanding better security, and Microsoft pretty much turned around. I mean, this is the turning point. This is when they were they're at their worst regarding security. And uh, they stopped all new development for several months, put all their developers to go back and look at old code bases, find vulnerabilities, fix stuff. And they started their trustworthy computing initiative implemented, well, first Windows updates to do automatic updates, and then all the other technologies that they've implemented since. And now, today, I have no complaints about the security level of Microsoft. They used to be the worst. Clearly, they've they learned from these dark years. And during the same year, we found another important virus. These, the, all these cases were being investigated inside our, our labs, uh, inside F-Secure. We run malware labs around the world and, and constantly 
monitor for outbreaks. And one outbreak we found in 2003 was malware called Fizzer, which isn't really remarkable by its technological features. It's remarkable because this is the beginning of the money-making with malware. Now, yes, we did mention the outlier, the AIDS information trojan from 1989. Yes, it tried to make money. And in fact, the author of that virus was caught and prosecuted. He actually pled insanity. He came to the courthouse half naked and wearing bones in his beard and stuff like that. It's, it's a weird story. <laughs> Nevertheless, Malware in general wasn't trying to make money. All these cases that we've seen so far were hobbyists who were writing viruses for fun. And then this changed with Fizzer. Fizzer, which was the first cooperation between email worm authors and email spammers. So Fizzer would infect a large amount of computers, then those computers would start sending spam. This is how spammers started to go around um, uh, spam filters and blocking of their servers. They couldn't send spam from their servers because they were being blocked, so they would start sending spam from other people's computers, from their workstations, from their home computers, which were infected by Fizzer. So this is how money-making uh, started uh, the modern money-making with malware started. And since then, we've seen an unlimited amount of banking trojans, and credit card uh, stealing malware, ransom trojans, botnets which make money by launching denial of service attacks against websites, and then you have to pay if you want to stop the attack. And all the attacks that we see today with cryptocurrencies, including rogue mining, and, and one of my favorite uh, well, not really my favorite, but one of, one of the creative techniques which we see with uh, cryptocurrency malware, which is that there's hundreds of malware right now which will only monitor your clipboard. And if it detects that you've copied uh, a Ethereum or Bitcoin or Monero address to your clipboard, it changes it to a different address. So you copy, because you want to send someone some money, you copy an address and then you paste it, and it's a different address. And of course, it, as you know, the addresses are long and you don't really remember the address, so you won't be able to tell the difference. A year after Fizzer, we then found Configure, which for the several years after that was the most common malware in the world, one of the biggest cases in history. This is 2009. Then we found Zeus, which was one of the biggest banking Trojan cases in history, the Zeus botnet and uh, related malware was being used to target more than 100 different banks around the world stealing money from people's accounts as they were doing online banking. And here, the attacks that banks were being targeted with, um, it's important to understand that the banks were not the targets, really, but where the targets were the bankers' customers. So if you want to steal money from online banks, you can try to hack the bank. If you get in, okay, that's where the money is. So you can, you can steal your million if you get into a bank, but it's hard because banks put a lot of effort to keep everybody out. What's easier, is not to hack the bank, but to hack, let's say, a thousand of the bank's customers, home users, small and medium companies. They do online banking. If you gain access to their systems, then you can steal money from their accounts. And of course, they don't have a million in their accounts, but they do have a thousand. And if you have a thousand victims, a thousand dollars each, that, that's your million. And it's much, much easier to do it that way. So over the years that I've worked with computer security, I only know maybe 10 cases, less than 10 cases, where banks themselves were being targeted by, by attacks like this. It's almost always the bank's customers who get targeted. Initially, typically home users. Nowadays, more and more corporate users, because of course, corporate users have more money in, in their accounts. And one thing I like to do when I go and visit our customers is that I ask them to show me around. Like, could somebody, you know, take me around and show your facilities. Tell me what you're doing in your company. And they're all always very happy to show Okay, here's, here's our manufacturing department, here's our design department, here's our top management, here's our sales guys. And then I ask to see the financial department. Where's your finance people? All right. It also means always that we go to the top floor, corner office. Here's our CFO, here's our controller. Nice, nice to meet you. Then I ask to see the person who pays the bills. So let's find that person. So far, every time, it's been a middle-aged lady. Very nice middle-aged lady. If it's a big company, it's maybe five middle-aged ladies. If it's a small company, it's one. And I chat with her about her work. So what do you do? Well, I pay the bills. All right. How do you pay the bills? Well, I use this online banking interface, corporate interface, so I have the security card to authenticate and all that. Hmm, nice. 
um, where's the computer that you used to do this with? And she shows her workstation, typically running Windows Vista or something horrible. <laughs> and then I ask the killer question, which is that, okay, now where's your computer that you use for Facebook and YouTube and, you know, surfing the net? Where's that? And she's now confused. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And you can almost see the light bulb go off the top of her head. Like, I'm using this computer to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. Why am I using the same computer to go to Facebook? It doesn't make any sense. A computer costs like 200 bucks. And this is the point I'm try trying to drive home. Like, it's not really rocket science. That computer is the main target of the financial attackers. That's the system they want to get their hand hands on. That's which controls where the money goes. If they get banking trojan on that machine, then they've won. And you can't completely seal that off from the internet. Of course not, because it has to be able to do online banking. You can't even seal it off from the internal network. You can't do your work. She has to be able to receive bills and stuff from, from the network, from emails. But why use it for anything else? No, have a separate computer for her to do everything else. Simple stuff. Works. And this is 2010. And 2010 was an important year in malware history because it was the year when we found Stuxnet. And we speak about time before Stuxnet and time after Stuxnet. That's how big a deal it was. And I have a homework assignment for you, which is to go and watch a movie, a movie called uh, Zero Day which is a documentary movie about uh, stocks. And I, I think I know every person uh, interviewed in the movie. And it's very, very accurate. It tells exactly how this went down. Stuxnet, which was an operation by US government together with the Israelis. Stuxnet, which was targeting Iranian nuclear program. That's what we know now. We didn't know that in the summer of 2010. Summer of 2010 was the most paranoid summer I remember. Because we found this really, really weird huge piece of malware, completely different from anything we've ever seen before. Like most malware was like small and encrypted and obfuscated. And this wasn't. It was huge. Not particularly obfuscated. Wasn't trying to hide. It was hiding in plain sight, basically. It didn't look like malware at all. And to make it even weirder, it had this code embedded which we had never seen before, which we later learned as we were learning, like teaching ourselves, what is this? That it was... Uh, ladder logic programming for PLCs, Siemens PLCs, programmable logic controllers, the things that run factories and power plants. We spent the summer together with basically the whole industry, all antivirus companies were working together. We were on the same chats and mailing lists with McAfee and Symantec and Sophos and Kaspersky, our best guys, our best girls, sp just spending the summer trying to figure this out. And eventually we started to realize that, you know, this is, this is big. Like, this has to be governmental. I mean, this has cost millions I mean, to create something like this. It had three different zero-day vulnerabilities in single malware. So it was just crazy. And then a researcher from Germany found this piece of code within the ladder logic programming where it was trying to fingerprint the victim. We were already guessing that this could actually be an operation targeting the Iranian nuclear enrichment program, but that was just guesswork. But as this German researcher uh, found this fingerprinting part, the question changed, because the fingerprinting was basically looking for high-frequency power converters, which had to be in certain configuration. The configuration is visualized in here. Configuration where you have high-frequency power converters f four, in rows of four, and then in chunks, which is sort of like the Fibonacci sequence, but not exactly. So it's one, 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 two, two, three, three, four, and so on. And this is highly unique. It's, it's like, as we figured it out, there's probably only one factory or one plant in the world which has configuration like this. And that's the target of this malware. And then the question becomes, is there a plant like this in Iran? And which is something you can't just go and Google for. <laughs> Except you sort of could. Because this German researcher went to the web page of the Iranian president, Mr. Ahmed, Ahmad, ah, this guy, <laughs> Ahmedinejad, this guy, and from his web page, believe it or not, 
he found a photo. Because this web page, as most presidential web pages, have pictures of his visits to different places, including visits to the Natanz nuclear site. You can see him walking by the centrifuges. And these centrifuges are being spinned by high-frequency power converters, the things that Stuxnet is searching for. Now, we don't see the converters, but we do see that they are in rows where there's four of them by each other. Then the actual Fibonacci th stuff, we can't see that at all from anything physical. That's just logical. So we don't really know if this is the right place. But in this collection of photos found from the president's website, there's one photo where the president is leaning over a computer. <laughs> and if we enhance, we'll actually see that it's exactly the same sequence in the code of Stuxnet and in this photo which was found from the page of the goddamn president. <laughs> this is what we call open source intelligence. <laughs> and this did change the game. Stuxnet changed the game in many ways. Yes, there were governmental operations before Stuxnet, of course, but this really changed the playing field in many ways and opened up the eyes of many other governments. Like, look at what the Americans are doing and the Israelis are doing. How come we're not doing this? And we ended up in an arms race. We ended up in an arms race where we are still today. We spent the last 60 years in nuclear arms race. I'm guessing we're going to spend the next 60 years in cyber arms race. Arms race where the players are intelligence agencies and militaries. Intelligence agencies spy. Spying is collecting information. Information has changed. Information used to be physical. It used to be on paper. So you had to physically go to the information to steal it or copy it. And today, of course, it's not. It's data. It's on our computers, on our networks. You don't have to go anywhere to reach it. This is why the work of intelligence agencies has, has changed. And as we look at what's going to happen in the upcoming years, well, it's increasingly hard to forecast the future. Part of my job inside F-Secure is to forecast our field, and it's hard. I mean, we're not even trying to forecast further than two years, and even that's, that's very hard. Nobody saw Petya and WannaCry. I definitely didn't forecast Petya and WannaCry, and those were the biggest cases of, of last year. In fact, biggest worm outbreaks of the last decade. In fact, we've only ever seen two malware outbreaks in history, which were combinations of ransomware Trojan and self-spreading worm technologies, which is exactly what both WannaCry and, and Petya did. But if you look beyond one or two years to, to uh, let's say, decades into the future, then nobody knows what's going to happen. Yeah, we could have quantum computers, could happen. Uh, Google just made an announcement yesterday on the new chips they've built. But that's all guesswork. One thing we do know for a fact which is going to happen is the apocalypse. This is the 2038 um, uh, counter problem in all Unix systems, practically in all Unix and li Linux systems, which calculate time as values of a signed 32-bit integer, which means it will go over on the 19th of January 2038. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that, well, that's, you know, that's way, way in the future. That's 20 years in the future. Why do we care? Well, it's actually less than 20 years in the future. And there are already, let's say, bank systems which calculate interest for the next 20 years, which means they already hit, in theory, this problem. 20 years is not that far. We saw that already. We saw that 18 years ago with Y2K, which we you know, thought, oh, we have plenty of time to fix this. And uh, turns out we got in a quite a bit of rush in the end towards it. Like these are actually, I remember buying these magazines in 1999. Crisis countdown, final alert, <laughs> doomsday 2000, the threat is real. Um, and then when the actual new year arrived, when we went from 1999 to 2000, I spent that night in our operations center monitoring if anything's going to happen, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. False alarm. Right? Well, let me tell you. It wasn't a false alarm at all. Instead, this was a massive success story. The older people here in the audience 
probably would agree with me that we had tons of things which we did fix before the new year. And the fact that nothing bad happened didn't tell us a story about a false alarm. It tells a story of a success story. We were able to fix tons of stuff beforehand. And even if there were problems, of course, they wouldn't show themselves exactly during the new year. You would find out about them much later. I'll give you one example. The UK healthcare system had a Y2K problem in their, uh, in their systems that they were using to diagnose pregnant women. And as an end result of this YK, Y2K problem, healthy babies were aborted in UK during the year 2000. They figured this out in the summer of 2000, six months after it had started happening. So yeah, Y2K did cause problems. It wasn't a false one. And 2038 will cause problems. Yes, we have 20 years to go. I'll guarantee to you we'll have problems in 2038. I'm just happy I'll be retired in 2038. Okay. And you can have a look at this yourself. You know, you can take the phone out of your pocket and you know, go to settings and change the date. You can't change it beyond 2038, regardless of what phone do you have. So it's, it's very real. And when we look at what's going to happen with the internet itself, well, internet originally was such a haven of freedom, wasn't it? And now, to me, it seems to be that it's, there's a fight over control of the internet. Internet has become a tool for governments to shape people's opinions, to do surveillance on foreign people or their own people, and to wage war and to spy. And this isn't really the internet that we thought we were given. And I see this as our responsibility, because we, we were given a free internet. Internet happened during our lifetime. What we got was a free and open internet. The question is, what kind of an internet are we going to leave to our children? So it really is up to us. And it's especially up to us technical people, people who understand how these networks work. And to make matters worse, it's not just about computers anymore. One of the biggest revelations I've had during my professional life is that I'm actually not a computer security guy. Well, I am a computer security guy, but computers have changed. For years and years, I thought that I am a computer security guy, so my job is to secure computers, right? Well. Today, everything is controlled by computers. Lights are on in this room because of computers. There's water coming out of the tap because of computers. Every single power plant runs on computers. Every single food processing plant, every single water purification plant, everything. So our job is not to secure computers. Our, our job is to secure the society because our societies run on computers. And this is thanks to the IoT and ICS revolutions. I think IoT revolution or connected revolution really started from, from factories, from ICS systems. Um, for example, Siemens started doing factory automation gear already in the 1960s. First with TTL systems and then later on with CPUs. And then this revolution now is coming to our homes. And the typical reaction um, that I hear from people when I talk about different vulnerabilities we found from consumer IoT appliances or kitchen appliances or things like that. Typical reaction is that people tell me that, oh, you know, IoT sucks, I'm not going to buy any of that IoT stuff to my home. And that's not going to be an option. That's not going to be an option. Right now, at this moment, when you go shopping for kitchen gear, you have two different options. You have smart devices and then traditional devices. Smart devices look different. First of all, they're more expensive. Second of all, they have a display, they have an app, they're online, and you know that they're online. But in 10 years, 15 years, even the traditional stuff, even the stupid stuff is going to be online, and you won't even know it. The reason why they will go online as well, it's going to be different. Smart systems are going online to give benefits to the consumer. User knows it's online, user pays more for the features. The reason why traditional stupid appliances will go online has nothing to do with the user. User doesn't even know it's online. It's about collecting data. Appliance manufacturers have all gone to a Gartner briefing where they've been told that data is the new oil. 
And now they're scratching their heads. The data is the new oil. How do we collect this new oil? We can't. You know, we're making toasters. We can't collect the information. And right now they can't because the price of putting a IoT chipset into a toaster right now is going to be 10 bucks, 15 bucks. Too expensive because the toaster only costs 10 bucks. But in 15 years, it's going to be 10 cents, 5 cents, 1 cent, free. And when, it's, when that's a reality, then even the stupid things will go online. And no, they will not be going online through your Wi-Fi. Because you could prevent that, you could control that. Why would they use your Wi-Fi? They will be using something different in 5, 10, 15 years. It's going to be 5G, LTEM, ZigBee 3, something new. They will be online and you won't even know it. We can't fight back against the IoT revolution. The IoT revolution is going to happen whether we like it or not. That's the way it's going to be. And if you look at any of the forecasts for many of the players, the numbers are pretty staggering. Billions and billions of devices will be online. And one of the side effects of that will be that we will have to start lying when we buy toasters. <laughs> because we will have to agree to a license agreement. And of course, that's the biggest lie on the internet. Because you, you never read these things, and if you would read them, you wouldn't agree with them. And this is true to everything. It, applies, it even applies to our software. When I read our own license agreement, and we are trying to be nice and responsible, even our license agreements are horrible. I think your license agreement is horrible as well. I haven't read it. I think I've agreed to it, but I haven't read it. <laughs> and it goes beyond software. This is a license agreement for cars, Land Rover. Um, you agree not to hack or insert any malicious code to Land Rover operating system. That's from their license agreement. Oh yeah, car hacking. Mm, this is an interesting topic. One um, thing that caught my attention last week was that I noticed that Porsche announced that they are going to introduce blockchain into Porsches. And I'm getting chuckles from people over here. They're like, what the hell? Why, why would you put a blockchain into a car? Well, that's what I thought as well. But I, when I looked into it a little bit more, it's actually not completely stupid. Now, blockchain, I believe, is one of the biggest innovations of the last 10 years. It's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, I, I think the sign of a good innovation is that when the innovation is explained to you, it seems pretty obvious. Like, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer maintained public ledger of transactions. Huh? That's it? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's pretty obvious. Yes, but it wasn't obvious until it was invented. That's how you can tell an innovation is a big innovation. So why or how would a car use a blockchain? Especially how could it benefit from blockchain compared to just a database? Well, one thing they are planning on doing with this is that these cars, they are in a network by themselves. Every car is a node. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. And they send log um, information about the car maintenance and engine data and, for example, odometer numbers to the blockchain. And blockchain is a public ledger of information. Anything you put in there is going to be public forever and unchangeable forever. This will kill autometer fraud. When you go and buy a used Porsche, then you can look at the number in the car and number in the blockchain. And if they're different, then you know which one is lying. The car is lying because blockchain can't lie. Okay, you could do this with a database. You could have exactly the same features by having Porsche to run you know, a server and have every car send their autometer numbers every day to Porsche. True. And that would work for a decade. But how long would Porsche want that server? 10 years? 20? 30? 40? Probably not. Like, how long will they pay the bill to AWS or Azure? That's the question. They're not going to pay it forever. So if you have a central server, it's going to fail before the cars fail, or all the cars fail. But if it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, if it's a blockchain, after 40 years, at least a thousand of those cars will still be in traffic and they will still maintain the autometer numbers for each other. Eventually, there's going to be 10 of them. It still works. Eventually, there's going to be two of them. It still works. Then when you have the last one left, then it doesn't work, but then it doesn't matter anymore. So yeah, there, there is something into this. Um, some of these innovation we're seeing in blockchain space is clearly, you know, there, there's something in there. But of course, there's so much bad as well. I see the bad sides in my work every, every day. Ransomware Trojans, uh, theft of uh, uh, 
digital currencies, hacking into exchanges, changing the addresses in clipboard, as, as we spoke about. And now we're seeing more and more rogue mining, which affects your users. Users, those of your users who run JavaScript, which is, has got to be 99.9% .9 of your users. Um, that's a, uh, a mining system from Iceland. Um, pretty big part of uh, cryptocurrency mining, like industrial level mining, is done in China or in Iceland. In Iceland, because they have good cooling and uh, cheap electricity, because they have volcanoes. Um, and in China, because in China, government subsidizes the electricity, so it's cheap because of the subsidies, the subsidy system. But what happened last year was fairly interesting. There was this German company called um, Program, or the website is called Program, Program.de, which is basically 4chan for German users, an image board. And they were selling gold accounts to users. Um, and many of the users didn't want to register with their real names, so they started accepting Bitcoin and Litecoin as payments. And then eventually they innovated a new system for paying for the gold accounts, which was that if the user would open up this pop-up window and keep it open, they would be a cold user. And if they closed the window, then they would be a regular user. And then they actually explained to the users that the way this works is that that pop-up window runs on JavaScript, which mines for, not for Bitcoins, because you can't do that with Bitcoins anymore, it mines for Monero, which you can actually mine eff eff uh, fairly efficiently with JavaScript. And those Moneros, of course, go back to the website, not to the user, but to the website. That's how you pay. Now, that's actually not a bad idea. I mean, when it's explained to users, when the site is open about what they're doing and the user agrees that this is a good trade-off, that's a good trade-off. I, I like that. And it worked so well for them, for these German guys, that they actually made a startup out of it, a startup which they call CoinHive, which is that same technology packaged into something that you can put on any website. And very quickly they got competition, most notably JSC, Coin, and Bro Miner, which basically do the same thing. And some sites started using this. For example, Salon, the newspaper, you can either look at ads or you can run a script. So those are your options. And I think this is actually fairly interesting. I, I can't exactly put my finger on it, but I think there's something in here. Something which, I mean, it not this, but something beyond this. Some, some way of users paying for content where the users do some sort of proof of work. Not necessarily mining for cryptocurrencies. It could be storage. It could be solving something different. Creating a network supercomputer. I don't know. There's something in here. But yes, there's also tons of fraud. Ten years ago, when somebody would hack a website, they would deface the website. They would delete the front page and put pictures of something horrible on the front page. That's what we used to see, like online graffiti. Five years ago, if somebody would hack a website, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't change the website at all. They would just add an exploit kit there, which would try to exploit the users as they visit the website and then drop malware on their computers. And today, when somebody hacks a website, they put a script there which is going to mine cryptocurrencies in the background. And this is uh, what we call crypto jacking. And the way we try to fight this is by detecting these malicious scripts just like we detect malware or any other type of malware. We call these coin miners. And it's a game of cat and mouse. Of course, they are modifying the script all the time. We try to detect them, trying to detect automatic systems where we detect the JavaScript, which just eats 99% of the CPU. Turns out there's lots of good scripts which do exactly the same. It's not an easy problem to solve. I'm sure you know about this. Nevertheless, and the amount of money ransomware gangs are making with, with malware is in millions and millions. Of course it is. And as the valuations of uh, cryptocurrencies have skyrocketed, the money they've been making is getting better and better. So, for example, the Petya and WannaCry cases from last year are directly tied to the fact that this had become so mainstream. I chose a picture of an ATM getting infected by Petya because I think it's a good example. Uh, normally when you go to an ATM, it's you asking money from the ATM. Now it's the ATM asking money from you. And when we look at companies which reported big problems with Petya, they, these are very well-known public brands. And I actually believe that the Petya outbreak or not Petya outbreak of last July was the single most expensive computer security incident in history. 
single most expensive computer security in incident in history. More expensive than any data leak, more expensive than any hack, more expensive than any outbreak. And criminals themselves are changing. For example, this guy. Kennedy. Kennedy Kapkanov from Russia. Now, don't get me wrong. Not all hackers are Russian. Because some of them are from Ukraine. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Kennedy was the guy who was running the Avalanche botnet, um, which was one of the biggest botnets we've seen over the last years. And when he was eventually found and uh, the investigation led the Russian law enforcement to his apartment and they knocked on his door, he responded by shooting back with his rifle. And then he jumped from the fourth floor balcony and ran away. And this is a little bit different kind of a criminal than what we think about when we think about hackers, like criminal hackers. But this is the change we're seeing. And if someone would have told me in the beginning of my adventure into the world of malware in the early 1990s, if someone would have told me that eventually we won't be fighting teenage kids who are writing viruses for fun, but we will be fighting organized crime gangs which make millions with their malware attacks, and we will be fighting foreign intelligence agencies and militaries, and we will be fighting extremists and terrorists. I would not have believed that. That would have sounded like science fiction. But this is exactly what has happened. This is exactly the world where we live in today. And the main reason why we haven't seen more, or actually why we haven't seen cyber terrorism yet at all, is interesting. Now, Cyber terrorism, I'm defining it as an actual terror attack done over the internet, done with computers, or a real attack, like a bomb attack, which is made worse by combining a cyber attack at the same time. For example, I don't know, doing a denial of service attack to shut down 911 at the same time when there's a bomb attack. No, no, nothing like this has ever happened. Al-Qaeda has never done anything like this. Islamic State has never done anything like this. Um, they do use the internet. They use it for communication. They use it for uh, encrypted communications. They use it for recruitment. They use it for propaganda. But that's what every organization does. Like every company, every organization uses the internet for communication, for recruitment, for propaganda, or ads, if you will. But they are, or haven't been able to move their operations into the internet. It's not for the lack of trying or wanting. They would want to. Uh, I believe the main reason why they haven't been able to do more is that U.S. Army has been very efficient in doing targeted drone strikes to kill Islamic State hackers. There's been multiple drone strikes, mostly in Syria, to kill Islamic State hackers. Once again, the whole sentence, U.S. Army has done a drone strike to kill a hacker. Doesn't that sound like something out of a science fiction book? Has happened multiple times. So let me make a forecast. we will see a human uprising against the robots. And when I say that, I know what you're thinking. First of all, you're thinking that Mikko's gone crazy. Second of all, you're thinking Terminator. <laughs> and I'm not speaking about Terminator. I don't mean Terminator at all. Last summer, I was speaking with an old friend of mine who nowadays works for a startup which creates um, IoT sensors. IoT sensors for trash cans. So the idea is that you have a sensor that you put into every trash can in a city. It locates or records the location of the trash can and measures how full it is. And then you can optimize how you empty the trash cans. Pretty nice initiative, pretty green. They call this the Internet of Bins. <laughs> and as they started deploying this, they ran into problems. Because these sensors that they were putting into trash cans started to come back to them broken, horribly broken. They couldn't figure out why they were, because they, these are really hardened things. They're supposed to be inside a trash can, yet they were breaking up. 
And they couldn't figure it out until they started looking at CCTV camera or security camera footage. And from the footage, they saw that these things weren't broken by accident. They were actually being beaten into pieces by the truck drivers who were emptying the trash cans. Because before the sensors, they would go around once a week to empty the trash cans. After the sensors, they would go around once a month. The drivers hated these things. Of course they hated them. This is the human uprising against robots I'm talking about. And if you think about the most common job titles in this country, number one, truck driver. Number one most common job title is truck driver. Second is fast food worker. Every single truck driver is going to be unemployed, most likely within our lifetime, because of self-driving trucks. Will some of them protest? Will some of them want to rise up against the machines? I don't know. I, I guess. I guess it's going to happen. This is the problems we're facing. And of course, this doesn't mean that this evolution or revolution in technology is something we should hold back. If you think back in history, a couple of hundred years ago, we didn't have artificial power. If you wanted to build a house, you had to use your own muscles. Then we invented steam engines and electrical engines and you know things got easier. I don't think any of us would prefer to live in a world where we hadn't in invented artificial power. But many people got in unemployed because of that in innovation as well. It's going to happen again. So it's been a pretty wild ride from these early floppy-based viruses to where we are today. One thing is clear to me. It's getting harder and harder to forecast what's going to happen next. But every single problem we have, we can divide either into technical problems or people problems. And technical problems can be hard to fix. But at least we know how to fix them. Because technical problems are bugs, software bugs, bugs created by human programmers because humans make mistakes. So as long as programming robots haven't replaced humans, we will have bugs. People are laughing here, it's going to happen. I mean, we will get programs which, which program, maybe not during our lifetime, but it's going to happen. So we know how to fix bugs. We fi fix a bug, we update the systems, vulnerability is closed. It could be hard, but it, it can be done. But fixing people is hard. There's no patch for people. The only patch we have is education. Education is hard. And we are expecting everybody to be online today. Everybody from teenage girls to grandmothers has to be online to use all the services our societies have today. And we can't expect everybody to be a security expert. And I hate that users are always blamed for security problems. A stupid user clicked on a link. Well, you know what? It's not a stupid user. I mean, links, links are supposed to be clicked. Links are supposed to be clicked. We, I mean, we can't expect everybody to be an expert. And we shouldn't put the responsibility on people who can't handle it. Some people can. I'm guessing most of us here think we can handle our own security. But what about our mothers or grandmothers? So we shouldn't put the responsibility on people who can't handle it. We should take the responsibility away from them and put it to where it belongs. And it belongs to operating system manufacturers. It belongs to operators and telcos that provide the connectivity, which brings the problems to these users. And it belongs to security companies. And we have a long way to go until we are there. Once again, I'd like to thank you for your work. Thank you for your work, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, um, Nico. So we are going to start in the room. We have a bunch of folks who came out to hear you. Do we have any questions in the room to start with? Right next to me. Thank you. My name is Tristan Weir, and I'm also with the Information Security Group here. Um, you spoke about security companies and uh, nation state actors. And uh, late last year, the US government accused Kaspersky of working with Russian intelligence services, um, or maybe implicated is a better word. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could talk either about that 
example or about more broadly the trust that is placed in security companies and malware companies and how they work with nation mm -hmm. states? Security companies have unprivileged or I mean, have very privileged access to all the data on the computers they're protecting. This applies to pretty much every single security product and we must not abuse that power we have over users. So one thing I've been calling for for now multiple years is for security companies to publicly report exactly what kind of data they collect from end user computers and how is it being sent back. We've done our work, we published, we have a public report on our website detailing exactly what we collect and how do we send it back. Um, I'm not aware of any other security company which would do that at the moment. And this is a problem. We, we should be responsible enough to tell our users exactly what we do. Um, regarding Kaspersky in particular, um, I don't think Kaspersky Lab as a company is any closer to Russian government than to what, let's say, McAfee and Symantec are close to US government. And of course, Symantec and McAfee are close to US government. At the very least, they're customers. There's a customer relationship. Exactly the same thing applies to Kaspersky. Kaspersky is a great product. I, I know Yevgeny. I've known him for 20 years. I know many of their researchers, world-class people, excellent people. It, it's a great product. Having said that, would I recommend, for example, US federal government to run a Russian security product on their systems? No, I wouldn't. I think that's just a stupid idea. But using it for home users or you know, small and medium market, I, there's no, nothing wrong with the product. And nothing has been proven about that. But security companies have a very clear responsibility and we should be open about what we do. I, I want to take a few online. I'm sorry. I'm going to take one online because we've had a lot online too. This is tough. We have a lot of questions for you, Miko. I have time. Um, <laughs> do you? All right, well, um, we may cut it off um, for the stream, but yeah, I think we might have to. But if you're in the room, note that. Um, so we had a question about the, mal the malware examples you focused on. You focused on a lot of mass malware, things designed to impact m as many victims as possible. But there are also targeted malware, like the Trident kit discovered a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, we've made incredible progress against mass malware. Um, but do you think our industry is also making adequate progress at addressing targeted malware? Yeah. Targeted malware is, needs different kinds of solutions. Um, targeted malware is the cases where there's only, for example, one computer in the whole planet which is being targeted, or one company, or one person being targeted. So these are typically uh, governmental operations, intelligence operations, or military operations. And that means that the attacker knows the environment that he or they are about to breach. They know what kind of systems there are in place, they know what kind of firewalls, what kind of intrusion prevention technologies they have to breach, and then they just go and buy all these technologies and make sure they are able to breach them before they launch the real attack. So it's not a really fair game between the defenders and attackers because the attackers have access to our weapons. That's why it's hard to defend against targeted attacks. The good news is that very few people are being targeted by targeted attacks, but it doesn't really make you feel any better if you are one of those people. So the way we think about fighting targeted attacks is by combining our technology with human powers. We, we run a system called RDS, which tries to defend users which are being targeted by targeted attacks by having a large amount of sensors in their networks, collecting as much information as we can, and then we have automation to try to detect anomalies. And those are then actually passed to people. We have centers manned 24 hours looking for these anomalies, try to detect targeted attacks as they happen. And one example of technologies which, which work here are reputation-based technologies, which um, give us information what is normal, what, what is common on people's computers around the world. So, for example, which applications are really common, which applications are rare. So, for example, Firefox EXE, some 64-bit version of uh, uh, Firefox, would be very common. Millions of executions every hour all around the world. But then when you have somebody running a program which has never been run before, anywhere. Well, that's weird. And for example, our security products will block them, but they will tell the user that you just tried running a program, and we scanned it, and we can't find anything wrong with it. We can't find anything bad in it. We've never seen this before, but we do know that you are the first person on the planet who runs this. And that's not normal, unless you're a developer yourself. If you just compiled it, then of course you are the first to run it. But if you just compile it, then you know 
why you are the first person to run it, then you can whitelist it. If you're a normal user, this is an attack. And that's something which the attackers cannot bypass. I mean, if they make a targeted attack against the user with unique malware, we can use the uniqueness to block it. And I like mechanisms like this, where we use the attacker's attack against themselves. All right, thanks to your gracious offer to go. We're gonna go about five minutes over, so if you're on the stream and you wanna hear some questions, we're gonna go five minutes over. If you have to leave, please, don't feel bad. So um, let's take, was there one more in the room? I just wanna, I think someone, did you have a yeah. question? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Michał, also from the Information Security Group. Uh, given the unrestricted access the, the antivirus software has on the uh, client system, what do you think about the antivirus software itself becoming a target because of the huge attack surface it mm -hmm. actually brings to the system? Yeah, that's, that's a nightmare scenario for us security companies. And once again, it's something we take very, very seriously. Uh, antivirus systems are running with root access or admin access on the systems they are on, and of course they can have vulnerabilities themselves, and they have had. Our systems have had vulnerabilities ourselves. So we try to minimize that attack surface, just like you try to minimize attack surface in, in your browsers. Um, and you, as you know, it's not easy. Um, one thing we do, like most security companies nowadays, is that we run a bug bounty. We, we pay users who find vulnerabilities in our systems. That doesn't really make you feel any better when the attacker is a target attacker. If they find a zero day from our system, they're not going to sell it to us. They're going to use it against our customers. Um, we have multiple different mechanisms on how, how we try to minimize this. Um, don't probably want to go public on the record exactly everything we do, but I'll just say it's something we take very seriously because we know we have a huge responsibility on our user systems. Okay, so we need to ask this question because we're at Mozilla. So the question is, is as a security research, researcher yourself, what would you like browser vendors like Mozilla to work harder at? Hmm. Well, I mentioned the crypto checking problem and the problem of being able to tell a bad JavaScript from a good JavaScript based on behavior or based on how how much it uses computer resources, and, and we've done a little bit of tinkering with that. It's hard. We could use some help with that part. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Another thing which needs fixing, which applies to you guys, is our certificate systems. And uh, we really can't live with the current model of uh, TSL certificates anymore and CAs. Uh, there's regularly horror stories about things going wrong with the current CA system. And I don't really know how exactly we should fix that, but we should fix that. So let's get started with those two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone's listening. <laughs> All right. We're adding blockchains. <laughs> All right, blockchains, that's going to fix it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask a follow-on question about blockchain. Um, so you <laughs> mentioned that blockchain is permanent and incorruptible, um, which is alone horrible. Um, how do you see blockchain being attacked? Hmm. Well, the, the security of blockchain in most blockchain models is secured by the peer-to-peer -peer network and the proof of work or proof, proof of stake or some other proof of mechanisms which can always be attacked if you have a large enough network of machines you can uh, apply yourself against the network. These are open networks. Anybody can join them, including the attackers. If you have enough processing power, you might be able to just take over the network. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, that's one, one scenario we have. Another problem um, which is quite different is, is sort of policy or let's say political problems. The example I could give there is the upcoming GDPR regulation uh, in EU, which is going to go into effect in May, which applies to every company in the United States if that company has European customers, which means every company in the USA. One regulation <coughs> says very clearly that um, customer must be able to contact the com company they are, they've entrusted private data with and ask their data to be deleted. Now, if the company in question puts the data into a blockchain, how the hell are you supposed to do that? Because everything you put into blockchain is unchangeable and public forever. You cannot delete it. And the GDPR regulation says you must be able to delete it. These, these are completely, completely incompatible requirements. The only way you can delete anything from blockchain is a hard fork. And if you have to delete something which was put there five years ago, you have to hard fork five years 
in the past. You can't do it. So how are we going to fix that? I don't know. Don't put publicly identifiable information into blockchains is maybe my, my <laughs> recommendation. All right. I think it's, it's five minutes after. I hate to keep you longer, folks on the stream. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we have a big round of applause for Miko? And if you don't know about Let's Encrypt, we'll talk about it. <laughs> I do. <laughs>